said essentially one question answers a lot of the challenges that we face today. And that is, we only have a right to ask what the right thing to do is. We need to ask what this earth requires of us for us to continue on it. And so that photo, that's my son John, who uh, at this hour I'm sure is giving his mother a tough time at, at uh, bedtime. But so with our children, I've learned the hard work of childhood is play. And John and his older sister Claire certainly do a fantastic job. They take their um, work very seriously. But, you know, as parents, my concern is, what sort of world are we creating for them in the decisions that we make every day in our personal lives, but also in how we design our cities and design our buildings, our systems of law? And so what I'd like to try to do in the next few minutes is just provide an answer to Wendell Berry's question. So when I first started to research this 10 years ago, as a recovering attorney, it's, uh, you painfully ask, uh, well, what is sustainability? How do you define it? And I found there really was no definition that was scientifically based or scientifically expressed. So when I started to research it, the first thing that really stunned me was we've actually become a geologic force. We've grown to such an extent, intruded into living systems, into ecosystems so intensively that we're a planetary force no different than a hurricane or a tsunami, but at a planetary scale. And so as a geologic force, that has certain consequences. That little red oval is the last 10,000 years. That's the Holocene epoch. It's a period of stability. That small little line is variability in, in a small difference in temperature. So a period of remarkably little change. The Holocene is home to all we know. All of our ways of design, all of what we believe, our systems of survival, our systems of agriculture, basically everything we see as life as we know it evolved within that little bubble. And one of the big consequences of being a ge geologic force is that we've shattered that. We've broken that bubble. So unfortunately, one of the consequences is dark. The good news is coming, I assure you. But as a geologic force, we've actually invoked the sixth great extinction event in the history of the world. It's the first since the dinosaurs disappeared 65 million years ago. And again, this seems sort of abstract, but when I left the practice of law, realizing there wasn't much use for it in the world, or for the tax and corporate law that I did, I went back to the family business for a short period of time and built houses and helped design cities. And so you can see how, as a geologic force, we've become what E.O. Wilson, one of the world's preeminent biodiversity scientists, calls the death of birth. It's in every decision that we make. Every time we go on a site, we basically scrape all the life off the site, dig a big hole, put a lot of toxic chemicals in to build the foundation, go into other living systems, extract a lot of resources and materials, and then build something that we call a house and hopefully make energy efficient. But this photo actually, I think, illustrates the death of birth as good as any. Those are actually one of 500 mountains in Appalachia that have been blown off for mountaintop coal removal. And so what you do is you blow the top of that mountain off, extract a very small seam of coal, and you can actually go to the website ilovemountains.org and track back from, say, this room or your house to which, which mountains were blown off and converted into electricity, uh, you know, for me as well. So it's a loss of functional adaptive solutions, too. The system, that forest, was one of the oldest, most biodiverse freshwater systems in the world. Biomimeric would say it's a, it's a source of functional solutions to the same design challenges that we face. The system of that mountaintop coal removing mine Functionally, it's dead to us. It doesn't provide any basic services that we would require for survival, what scientists call ecosystem function or ecosystem services. That's drinkable water, breathable air, uh, habit habitual climate, uh, soil fertility for food. And you can measure those. But so that's just to say what we believe has consequences. As a geologic force, whatever we emulate as our belief becomes the ecology of the world. So right now our myth our dominant myth in society is industrial efficiency. We tend to count carbon. We tend to just try to make things more efficient. We tend to try to standardize everything from our backyards to our kids' education. We try to eliminate redundancy and diversity from systems. In nature, redundancy and diversity are actually the source of life, the source of resilience, the source of adaptive solutions. There's unity in diversity. I think we know that culturally, but it's also true in natural systems. And so now that we've standardized the world, we see the same thing happening with the cultures. It's what Jane Jacobs and urban theorists called the standardization of spirit. 
We've already lost two-thirds of unique cultures that existed in the world. Each of those unique cultures, those 15 to 20,000 cultures we've lost, was the death of a world, the death of adaptive solutions to the same challenges that we face for survival, that we no longer have access to as the variability starts to intensify. Since we've broken the Holocene and triggered this sixth grade extinction, variability in terms of the storms we face, sea rise, kind of all the scary headlines that we read today, all of that's going to intensify. And as that intensifies, we're losing our, our sources of adaptive solutions in nature and in culture. And so the standardization of spirit based on efficiency is one way to do it. But really, this is where the, the story turns and the good news starts. The good news is if we just change what we believe, if we just have a value change for survival, and those are four words from a UN group of spiritual and parliamentary leaders, Dalai Lama, Chief Warren Lyons of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, um, Mother Teresa, any of the world's vision, visionaries that you would identify readily, came together, met for three years, tried to figure out what the solution to the world's challenges were. It came down to four words, value change for survival. Now, I don't think they thought about the fact that humanity was a geologic force and what you believe actually, the ecology of what you believe becomes the ecology of the world, but that's true. Value change for survival, if we change our values, then we can survive. If we continue on a path of industrial efficiency and consumption, most likely not. So E.O. Wilson, the same scientist that termed uh, death of birth is what you guys see on the screen there, Wilson's Law. You save the living world, the animals, the plants, it'll, it'll most likely save you. It'll most likely save us. But if we continue just to count carbon, if we continue just to look at the physical world, atmospheric concentration, the water, those sort of variables, we'll lose both. And so, value change for survival. That's my daughter Claire, by the way. Uh, so, what sort of values do you pick? If the ecology of the world is the ecology of what you believe, and the ecology of the world ends up in our bodies, then I, I chose kindness, because there's gratitude, there's generosity. Kindness translates, I think, roughly to abundance in natural systems. Uh, the permaculture talk just a few minutes ago talked about abundance and the kindness of finding a strawberry patch planted somewhere in the city just to take uh, what you would and hopefully the way of an honorable harvest so you don't harvest everything. But so if what we believe, if we are a geologic force, if we try to put kindness as a basis of design for our children, for ourselves, because our health is inseparable from that of future generations, then we have a chance. So I think the process is very simple. It's a process we use in all of our projects. Three steps. First, we try to remember the historic ecology. So we look back. This is a photo, an image from Manhattan as it existed in 1609, the day that Henry Hudson sailed up and discovered it. There was already a community there living uh, happily on the land, doing well. And then the other one's obviously recognizable as New York City today. So for me, the other inspiration I found was the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Great Law of Peace. In the Great Law of Peace, there's actually a rule that they have to, in every deliberation, consider the impact on the seventh generation to come. And so that's actually functional. Um, there's actually a representative at the table in the design process or decision-making process that advocates for the seventh generation. The seventh generation itself is kind of a, a vague, very difficult to discern concept. So what they're actually doing is thinking back and remembering the world of their great-grandparents first before they go forward to deliberate the world for their great-grandchildren. And so it actually does what resilience science does. Resilience science says if you want to design at any scale to try to manage change, to preserve identity, the way to do that is to first remember, because the force of remember in natural systems is structural. It's the seed bank in the forest after a fire. It is what regenerates the identity of that system, that culture, that forest. So if the fire burns, as long as it doesn't destroy the entire forest, and the entire seed bank, that seed bank will regenerate and the forest will preserve itself as a forest. So we do that in our projects. This is on the near west side of Syracuse, actually downtown Syracuse. This photo from 1920, that's the Hotel Truax. And so what the builders and engineers did here was actually deconstruct the foundation of the hotel, lift it up, roll it across the street, spin it 180 degrees, and then it set it back down on its original foundation. The hotel weighed about 12.4 million pounds. It took three months to do it. And the entire process, it didn't close. Guests checked in and out, enjoyed dinner, hot showers, all the services of a luxury hotel in 1920 during the entire process. 
to suggest something like that in downtown Syracuse or most cities today, I think would terrify our liability carrier uh, insurance wise. But I, I don't think, you know, it would really be a feasible idea. We'd get laughed away from the design table if we suggested something. But we just simply forgot that culturally this was just standard practice in 1920, or they at least believed that it was possible. So we do it at a smaller scale. This is deconstruction, this is decomposition, ecosystem scale, biomimicry. Same uh, city of Syracuse. House weighed 214,000 pounds. We salvaged about 186,000 of it. But we worked with, uh, it was actually an ex-gang member who was trying to help kids within that neighborhood. Kids, no different than my son John, if he grew up on the near west side of Syracuse, to give him a living wage. And we proved it was profitable. So at a bigger scale, life is land use law. You can look back to the historical ecology. You can set metrics. That's a zoning code. It's a zoning code of abundance. It's a zoning code of kindness. And so I would just finish with, again, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. If the faces of our future generations are looking up from the ground at us, and not even our future generations, but our children, because I'll go home and I'll see my daughter and my son, and they're already here. And so let them at least look at us and think that we're trying to do the right thing for them trying to design that ecology of abundance, that ecology of kindness.